Okay, well, welcome back. We are now going to um, move on to the remainder of uh, chapter one, or at least another major segment. We'll see how far we get. Um, so moving on to where we were from last time, we're gonna talk about uh, studying behavior um, and uh, neuroscience. So we have a definition first of behavior, which is quoted right here. Behavior consists of patterns in time. And so of course this means we need to talk about changes over time and anything that occurs over time. So clearly movements count here. And as we were talking previously about embodied and inactive cognition, the study of behavior in the form of studying movements of the body is of course very important. And later, as we get into the depth of this uh, course, we will be talking an entire chapter about the control of movement. How does the brain control muscles? And what is the, uh, and it's, it goes beyond just the study of how the brain activates muscles, but also how are movements themselves coordinated? It's one thing to talk about a signal from the brain to a muscle fiber that causes the muscle to contract, um, but when we control our bodies, we also control many limb segments all at the same time so that we can do fairly complex things with our bodies. And so we need to understand how that level of coordination is achieved. One classic example of that is the second one listed here, uh, speaking, vocalization, right? We produce with our vocal tract, a fairly complex series of movements coordinating the vibration of our vocal cords with movements of the lip, tongue, and jaw to produce a wide variety of sounds that are then produced so quickly, uh, and that, but yet it produces comprehensible speech that other people can hear. So clearly that's important to understanding um, uh, the nature of, of behavior and movement, and there's something happening in the brain that helps coordinate all of that fantastically complex stuff. We're also though, not going to be strictly behaviorists here. That is, we're not going to just say that only the so-called overt behavior can be studied, right? That is the visible movements of the body, but also cognition itself, which we might call just thinking, is also con considered a behavior, right? The events in the brain that correspond to cognition, perception, attention, reasoning, memory, that's all a form of behavior as well. And we want to understand how does the brain coordinate and regulate all of this information processing that's involved in both the perception of move of, of, of environmental uh, information, as well as the coordination of the body in response to that. Uh, and of course, there are many different ways that we can study what the brain is doing. I have a very brief list here. Uh, imaging studies or um, electrical responses here of the brain. That's what an ERP is, an event-related potential is the study of electrical potentials in the brain using EEG. We're going to have a lot more detail on these methods as we get further into the course. First thing we want to do is maybe talk, look about, look at two different ways to categorize behaviors. This is an important breakdown the difference between a fixed behavior and a flexible behavior, right? A fixed behavior is sometimes what we might consider to be an instinct. Fixed behaviors are defined as behaviors that simply do not change. So we see examples of this in the animal kingdom most often of behaviors that are very repetitive, simple, uh, and predictable. Uh, let me jump ahead real quick to the next slide because there's a couple of examples here on the bottom right is a, is a good example of this. These are herring gulls. And you can see the uh, parent herring gull has a long yellow beak with a small little red dot at the end of the beak. And we see a chick here um, reaching up to peck at that beak. And what the uh, early animal researchers discovered is that that long yellow shape with a red dot at the end is something of a trigger and that activates this pecking uh, instinct in the herring gold chick. Uh, and when the herring gold chick pecks at the tip of that beak, the mother here uh, regurgitates its food to feed the chicks. And so the chicks, when they wanna get fed, have to be able to peck at that beak 
to activate this regurgitation. So this pecking is a, is a fixed behavior, sometimes referred to as a fixed action pattern. And because it occurs in the exact same way every time and it, and it occurs in response to the exact same stimulus. So the stimulus is fixed and the behavioral pattern is itself also fixed. On the bottom left, the, um, the stickleback fish, right? What we see is that the male stickleback fish uh, engages in a couple of different fixed action patterns, right? One is that when it sees a, a, a rival male that has a red belly, uh, it attacks, right? So that's a fixed response. Uh, and when it sees a female that has a has a, um, a silver or gray belly instead of a red belly, um, it uh, engages in a courtship ritual known as a zigzag dance. And that zigzag dance is something, this is kind of a curious uh, aspect of instinctual behavior is that uh, these males, uh, do not have to learn the zigzag dance, right? We can raise the uh, male stickleback fish in isolation so that it never sees another male perform this dance, and yet it still is able to perform some variation of the zigzag dance. And that seems to, again, tell us that this is some instinctual inborn behavior that is unlearned. But again, it's fixed, right? Top right here, we see the famous ethology researcher, Conrad Lorenz, who studies imprinting in geese. We know that uh, geese, as soon as they hatch, will imprint on their mothers and follow along single file behind their mother. But what we see in this case is that uh, Lorenz discovered that there's nothing necessarily uh, instinctual about them being able to recognize their mother. Instead, what they are imprinting on is any large moving object. Uh, and that it could include himself, as you can infer perhaps from the uh, uh, from the from that uh, image. But again, oh, the idea is that that's a still a fixed stimulus in a large moving object, and the response is still again fixed, right? It is this imprinting response that involves following along wherever they go. One example from the book I threw in here was the study of the uh, crossbill, which seems to have a, uh, a beak that's uh, well suited to eating from pine cones. And uh, so it's another kind of innate and instinctual response uh, that is a fixed behavior, right? They don't seem to adapt to be able to eat from other food sources. They eat almost exclusively uh, pine cones right? in, their, in their biology. It equips them fairly well to be able to do this, right? They're what we'll call their morphology, right? Their body shape, some shape-based feature of their body, in that case, the beak. But not all behaviors are fixed, right? Animals can learn. We know this. This is very basic psychology. And learning entails a change in behavior over time. And so that means that what we'll call flexible behaviors uh, are uh, learned. And, and therefore they're not inborn. And so there's something else happening here. So we can understand it from a, from a purely behavioral perspective that there are some behaviors that are clearly fixed and, and consistent. And we might then say that they are inborn, innate, instinctual. And there are those others that are learned and therefore are acquired. So this is actually a little bit of a deviation perhaps from what we talked about previously with Locke, suggesting that we're born a total blank slate because in this case, the presence of instinct indicates that, no, we are not a total blank slate. But what's worth pointing out is that, especially with humans, we have very few instincts or instinctual fixed behaviors or reflexes that we are born with. We know there's a few, like a sucking and rooting reflex in infancy, as well as startle reflex and others. But those are all gradually and fairly early on, though, replaced by voluntary behavior, which we can then label as much more flexible and therefore learn. And so learning plays a really big role, uh, especially in human behavior, but certainly in a lot of animals, the capacity to learn and change behavior over time and adapt to changing circumstances is an important thing. So at the neural level, we would want to understand it from both perspectives, right? What's happening in the brain that enables animals to be born with fixed instinctual behaviors? what's happening in the brain that enables change, that enables learning and adaptation. So both of these things are pretty important here. Now, to start with, to think about instinct, 
we want to think about evolution. And for that, we're going to come and talk about Darwin. So with Darwin, we're going to talk about his theory of evolution by natural selection. So it's important to note that Darwin did not invent the idea of evolution. It had been around for um, really centuries, to, uh, to be accurate here. Uh, although in the approximately 100 years preceding the publication of um, uh, Darwin's uh, big uh, treatise on evolution by natural selection, there were various other evolutionary theories that had been proposed and debated for uh, during this time. None of them stuck around very much because what we see is that the significance of Darwin here is not inventing evolution, but it's rather providing uh, uh, a, a, a scientific explanation or theory of evolution that has persisted because it is so well supported by, by observation and by data and by further scientific testing. It made predictions that were further upheld and it has continued to persist now for about 150 years or so. So the idea is when it comes to explaining instinctual behavior is that these are behaviors that have some degree of adaptive value for the animal that has them. What does it mean to have adaptive value? Well, according to the principles of natural selection, species have traits that provide survival value. And, but where do they come from? Where do these, where, how do these traits appear? Partly the idea is that any given species might have lots of traits. And so this is the idea of what we'll just call variability. And there's a lot of variability in nature. A given animal species has a lot of individuals and not all individuals in a species are genetically identical and therefore they are not morphologically identical. They have slight variations in certain aspects of their body shapes, different colors, different, different uh, of plumage in a bird, for example, or fur and patterns in the fur, perhaps stripes or spots in a, in a, in a, in a mammal. Um, in birds, again, maybe slight differences in beak shape, like the, the crossbills we were just talking about. And so all of these variations, uh, some of them might be totally irrelevant to any particular uh, success or failure this animal has when it comes to survival. So if it needs to access food sources, for example, uh, some traits may have no role in that. And that might mean that this variation continues to persist and that animals will have a variety of different, let's just say, beak shapes, because this particular beak shape does not happen to um, uh, matter when it comes to accessing food. But let's just, continuing with the crossbill example, uh, imagine a situation where uh, a population of birds find themselves in an environment where there is a plentiful supply of pine cones to uh, eat, eat and consume, but not very much food of other sources. And let's say that in this collection of animals, this little limited isolated population of birds, uh, some of these uh, birds have beak shapes that are well suited to uh, to eat these pine cones, whereas some other members of this population do not. So as you can imagine, the idea now is that the birds that are having an easier time eating from this food source will survive longer. And the longer they survive, the more they will reproduce. And when they reproduce, their offspring are likely to inherit that particular beak shape that enables them to continue to survive and eat these pine cones. Whereas the other birds, uh, that don't have the ideal beak shape will live less long and have fewer offspring. And over time, after many, many generations, this population of birds will evolve to have a specific shape of their beaks that becomes uh, almost all identical in this regard because all of the other non-functional, non-adaptive beak shapes have been uh, weeded out essentially, right? And this is what Darwin means by the issue of natural selection. It is the natural environment, in this case, the presence of that food source of pine cones that has selected a beak shape that is adaptable to that uh, and caused those birds that have that right beak shape to, to pass on their traits, whereas the rest of the birds did not. This is what we see right here in this little 
flow chart, um, we see a, a variations in traits, right? Sometimes you just, like I said, you have a population that has a variety of different traits. A lot of this is purely random. Sometimes these random new traits emerge because of random genetic mutations over time. But again, some of those traits, they don't matter whatsoever uh, in terms of the survival of that animal. So they, so they just may continue to, to persist in a population. Some of them, though, may turn out occasionally to be especially adaptive, given the nature of the food or some other environmental constraint that is uh, giving pressure on this animal species to survive. And so that particular trait manages to live on and the others do not. So we end up with increased survival and increased offspring. And that's how the traits, of course, pass on. So another key theme that we take from uh, Darwinian biology is that life has evolved on Earth from a common ancestor. And that means that all animal species essentially have evolved from the same common ancestor, which further entails that all animal species are in various ways genetically related to each other because brains are parts of their bodies, again, hinting back to that embodied cognition, uh, that means that all brains and bodies are essentially working according to the same core principles. So that means that if I want to understand something about the activity of nervous systems or of cardiovascular systems or of musculoskeletal systems or of digestive systems, I can study those in different animal species and make comparisons across those species to understand that, yes, these principles look more or less the same across species. This is known as comparative biology to understand how uh, digestive systems work pretty much the same in certain species, although there are, of course, certain divergences here and there at, from an evolutionary perspective, but we can trace that out in a meaningful way. But again, because we are still talking about the relationship between brains and behavior, and that psychology is something that we will use, uh, explain with neuroscience, that means that because brains are uh, related to each other across species, nervous systems and brains, that means then that behavior uh, is essentially this working on the same principles across different animal species. So if I want to understand learning, or if I want to understand instinct, um, although that's a curious thing, because sometimes instincts are what we'll call species-specific behaviors. And so there's not a lot of comparative psychology to do when it comes to looking at um, the pecking behavior of those herring gulls, because that's something that occurs in only herring gulls. That's a species-specific behavior. Um, but so we might start to wonder, for example, though, what about imprinting in geese, right? That's something that has clear survival value as an instinct, right? That the geese who have adapted the ability to, to instinctually imprint on their mother, follow the mother around on day one of their life, uh, are more likely to survive and, and grow to maturity. And that means they're more likely to have offspring, which will also, who will also imprint on their mothers. So, um, we might think, does that help us understand anything about, say, uh, attachment processes in humans, because we know human uh, humans tend to be attached to their offspring, our babies, and the babies are attached to their parents. And human attachment behavior is an important part of our emotional or socio-emotional development. Uh, what's the relationship there, right? And there's research on this, right? But the idea that you can study this, that you can understand the nature of, of this kind of animal behavior and human behavior and understand both similarities and differences between them, that's part of what we'll call now comparative psychology. But the claim, of course, is that the processes happening in other animals are fundamentally the same kinds of processes. Learning happens in dogs in the many ways in which the same way it happens in humans. Of course, we, we know that because of research by the likes of Pavlov and Watson, right? Watson, Pavlov discovered classical conditioning, demonstrating that he could create a conditioned response of dogs salivating in dogs. Watson should use the similar Pavlovian techniques to, to demonstrate a conditioned emotional reaction in the Little Albert experiment. So there's another example of comparative psychology. To talk about evolution a little bit more. We can also talk about the timeline here. There's not a lot of depth here, but just a, a few facts about um, 
you know, life on Earth being around three and a half billion years of age. Uh, but that doesn't mean that those earliest life forms had any uh, a, a sense of a nervous system. And, and we have to think, what is it that a nervous system gives uh, an organism, right? One of the things that we realize is what you know, I said earlier about the importance of movement. A nervous system helps us respond to our environment. And that means nervous systems seem to be important when it comes to detecting things happening outside of our bodies, right? So that's that's the idea. And of course, this is where that extended part of extended cognition comes in, is that nervous system helps extend our life out into the environment so that we understand what's out there. And, it, and it, but it also helps coordinate a reaction to that, to that information from the environment. So it's about sensing the environment, but it's also about controlling movement of our bodies. And so we would uh, imagine then that the earliest neural systems, whether that's just individual neurons or small groups of neurons, evolved for that purpose, to aid that organism in sensing its environment and doing something about whatever it has sensed. This occurred around 700 million years ago. Now, small groups of neurons or nerve nets, as we might call them, um, have limited ability to support uh, learning, right? So a lot of these very early um, sensing and reacting uh, processes were probably fixed behaviors, right? To learn might require a little bit more of a, a complex nervous system. And this is when we might start talking about brains. Now there are intermediate steps here. So there's quite a bit of depth that I'm not going into that takes us from the earliest neurons to the first brains. But something like a brain first emerged about 250 million years ago. But what we're talking about as a brain there is nothing at all like the human brain, which is really, really large and complex. And so what I might call the first human-like brain, uh, a large cerebral cortex, uh, or at least the emergence of something with a cerebral cortex around 6 million years ago. But Homo sapiens with our large cortex, uh, that's a far more recent evolutionary development here, only 200,000 years ago. Here's a little bit of that content, right? So as I said, uh, a nerve net is just a very simple nervous system that has sensory and motor components to it. So the sensory component would be some sort of a sensory detector. It could be a light detector. That could be a primitive eye of some sort. Uh, could be a, a chemical detector that detects the, uh, the uh, salinity or acidity uh, of some, some water, right, that the animal might be in. Um, and then there are motor, would, those would connect up directly to motor neurons that control movement uh, of that organism, right? So there's no necessarily, well, of course, this is the question, of course, what we call the hard problem before, does this entail consciousness? Does this animal somehow have awareness of its environment? Or is just this some sort of a simple automatic response that does not entail the emergence of some self-awareness and self versus outside world awareness? In fact, where and how that emerged, again, that's part of the hard problem. We don't know. Um, something else that we start to see um, developing with more complex nervous system is called the segmented uh, nerve trunk. And so this is the idea that there would be different levels and layers of almost a hierarchical organization uh, to a, a nervous system, right? So there might be simple peripheral components, but a more centralized uh, uh, central part of the brain that's a hierarchically receiving input from more of those peripheral areas. And what we oftentimes see in such organization is a, is a bilateral symmetry, right? These uh, organisms start to have a, a left and right body symmetry. And that left and right external body symmetry is reflected by a left-right symmetry um, to the nervous system as well. So the nervous system is now segmented in a way that uh, is, is both kind of uh, uh, vertical, right? This, this hierarchical building up from simple peripheral components to more centralized higher level components, but also horizontally in the sense of this left-right division of the, of the body and, it's, and the nervous system that controls it. And very simple, uh, nervous systems, uh, if we get something that's kind of like a brain, but we're not going to call it a brain, we'll call it a ganglia or ganglion, singular ganglia, plural. 
So these are clusters of neurons, clusters of cells that work together uh, to do something, right? process information, maybe adapt and learn perhaps, right? That can be something that's supported by these clusters of neurons. What's important about the neurons in, the, in a ganglion structure is that they are not specifically sensory neurons, right? They're not responding to external stimulus in a, in a direct way. And they're not motor neurons. Right? Just, they're not directly synapsing onto some sort of a, a, a muscle fiber or some other component that triggers movement of the animal. They are some intervening process. And so this idea that sensory information might feed into a ganglion, that is a cluster of neurons, and something happens in that ganglion that before the response is triggered, seems to suggest that this is where we might see the emergence of flexibility and adaptability in behavior, right? It's not just a simple stimulus followed by a response necessarily, right? That is the sensory input feeding directly onto a motor response like a reflex, but maybe a little more complexity in between. Further on up, we see the evolution of uh, the chordates, right? Those that have a more of a clearly defined or what we'll call central nervous system of a brain and spinal cord. So as here we see now that chordates have some of the things that we've already mentioned, right? We have this bilateral symmetry and segmented nervous system, right? We have the peripheral feeding into the spine, feeding into then the the brain, which is also segmented into the hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain, right? So that's part of that vertical segmentation that I was talking about. Uh, we also see now the the, the encasement of the of the um, of the central nervous system in a bony protective uh, layer here, with the spinal cord and the and the brain being uh, protected by bones. So bones now are playing a role not just to give uh, shape and structure to the body and the limbs, right, but also to provide some protection to that nervous system. It's very important. We also see in chordates the evolution of the infamous crossed organization, that is the, the left side of the body maps onto the right side of the central nervous system, and the right side maps to the left side of the central nervous system. It's not quite, quite clear why this has happened, though there's some speculation that there was some sort of weird twisting of the of the head in the evolution of, of uh, limbs and walking uh, that has led to the uh, this kind of crossed organization in, in uh, chordates. Um, also a common feature here is how the spinal cord kind of lies um, dorsal to the uh, to the gut and to the other kind of core uh, internal organs, right? So behind, towards the back of the body, um, another common feature in chordates. So let's talk a little bit about brains as well. Um, so as what we are seeing here is that nervous systems have gotten more complex with going from simple uh, sensory and motor neurons to nerve nets to ganglia, that these brains are getting bigger and more complicated with more and more neurons. And so more neurons means bigger brains. And that seems to suggest that with bigger brains and more neurons, we get more complex behaviors. And uh, so we start to think, well, let's understand something about brain size. Is that important? How important is it? What, is, what do we learn from looking at brain size? Uh, so that's important, but one thing is, is that's also pretty important here is that brain size in and of itself is potentially misleading. This is what's known as the principle of proper mass, which is a bigger body kind of needs a bigger brain. And it makes sense if we think about everything we've been covering, this idea that if I have uh, the more sensory processes that I have, for example, if I have eyes, if I just have a, let's go, let's go back to some of those early evolutionary processes we were talking about, like some of the very earliest evolutionary uh, uh, advances in sensing might have involved a, an eye spot. And that might've meant that there could have been a, a couple of neurons on, on a surface of, a, of that organism that were light sensitive neurons, photoreceptors. And that could have fed directly onto a motor neuron. So now we just have a couple of neurons, a couple of sensory neurons and a couple of motor neurons. In our further evolutionary advances, we might have a few more of those photoreceptors that feed into a ganglia, ganglion that might be a few hundred neurons, right? And that, of course, creates a little more complexity to what this animal can do with its visual input. 
And so we have more neurons because we have more sensory receptors and we have all these extra ganglial neurons to process what those sensory receptors are doing. If I add to my uh, animal uh, sense of touch, now I have to have some mechanical receptors on the skin surface of this animal, and that has to feed to a different ganglion in this primitive brain that processes information from all of those receptors. So now we've got a visual center and a tactile center uh, to this animal's brain, and so now it's a bigger brain. And if this an animal starts to be able to move around, then we might start to think about, well, we need a motor section to the brain. And the more moving body parts that this animal has, is it just a, is it just a simple, uh, you know, form that just has a couple of different ways of moving, like maybe it has a, uh, it's a, it's a flagellum that, that propels it through the water, uh, in which case there's not a lot of complexity to that. It just needs to steer that a little bit, maybe just a few different motor responses. But if we start talking about a, a multicellular animal that has limb segments, how many limb segments and how many muscles are required to control those limb segments and how big are those muscles? And the idea is that with, with uh, more limb segments means more muscles. Uh, and and it's, there's a difference between what we might call a limb segment that just has a single segment versus a limb segment like the human arm, which is two different segments that work together. And so that means you've got more muscles with joints in between them. And that means we have to have more neurons in the brain to control all those extra muscles. And as the muscles get bigger, you need more nerves to innervate all of those different muscle fibers within the nerves. So the idea there is that as bodies get bigger with more sensory organs and with more limbs and more muscles to coordinate and control, you end up with a bigger brain. That doesn't necessarily mean that the animal is more intelligent. It just means that you need more neurons to support a bigger body. So that's what the principle of proper mass is. What we are really interested in, if we want to understand issues of complexity, is not necessarily the absolute size of the brain, but the question is, is, is that brain uh, maybe larger than we might otherwise predict given the animal's body size, right? And this is referred to as the encephalization quotient. The encephalization quotient refers to a brain that is perhaps just, just, just big enough to do the basic kinds of things that that body needs. Uh, and not, not any bigger, right? But if you find an animal that has a lot more extra brain than you would expect given their body mass, you would think, wow, there's a lot of extra stuff happening in that brain, in that animal's brain, that perhaps means that, the, that there, that's where this extra complexity comes from. So here's where we would look at the encephalization quotient, right? This, uh, on the x-axis, we have body weight or body mass, right? On the vertical axis, we have the brain weight or brain mass, right? And we would have a linear function here. We just simply look at the, the, the you know, get a scatter plot of all these different animal species and fit a, fit a best fitting line, a simple linear regression to that. You get that uh, purple line right there in the middle. Any animal whose brain falls right on that uh, line is what I was saying before, it's an animal whose brain is exactly the right size to fit their body and does the basics of what it needs, right? And we see a lot of animals are really close to that line as you would expect. You don't find too many animals whose brains are really sm abnormally small, or I should say unexpectedly smaller than their bodies. That's not quite a thing really, right? But what we do occasionally find are animals that have an unexpectedly large brain. And that's what the points that sit well above the line. And we see a couple of examples of that. We see some, um, um, some uh, primate species uh, like the gorilla, right? Or chimpanzees, th their points, baboons too, uh, are there above the line. Um, Australopithecus, that's an early pre-human uh, ancestor, also actually even further above the line. Dolphins, surprisingly large brains compared to their bodies but Homo sapiens even further above the line than where they would be predicted based on, because dolphins generally have a bit larger body than humans. So we move a little bit up the x-axis there, but the extent to which they sit above that line is not nearly as much as it is for Homo sapiens, right? Us humans have uh, a very unexpectedly large brain compared to our body mass, right? And so this is where we think, oh yes, we have the intelligence, right? That's us. So, but let's talk about primates, because as I said, you know, chimpanzees and gorillas are also are sitting there above the line. So uh, the, the appearance of this large brain that supports some complexity of, um, of 
behavior, uh, both in the, in the level of sensing the environment, but also responding to the environment with flexible behaviors and learning, uh, seems to be something that doesn't exist just in Homo sapiens, right? It's, it also is found in other primates, also in dolphins, but I think we know a little less about dolphin behavior compared to uh, how much work has gone into studying, uh, studying apes in particular. Um, so what do we know about primates, for example, color vision? So there's something, let's, you know, think about the, the nature of that, right? The idea is that in order to have uh, color vision, we need at least two kinds of photoreceptors that respond to two different wavelengths of light. That's called dichromatic vision. But humans and some uh, primates have what's known as trichromatic, meaning we have three different kinds of receptors. In fact, we actually have four because we have rods and cones in the eye and the rods are not part of the color vision system, but the cones are, and we have three different kinds of cones. So that's really four different kinds of visual receptors and then we have a lot of those, we have millions of them, right? And all of that has to feed into the brain where you have to have a whole large area of cortex in the brain to process all of that differential wavelength information to be understood as differences in color. That's just for color vision, not to imagine all the other stuff we do with, with seeing, such as object recognition and movement and that sort of thing, right? In fact, the second one there, uh, primates, we have our eyes right here on the front of our face. Um, that means that our eyes have a very similar view on the world, right? That we have an overlapping field of view with our two eyes compared to say a rabbit, for example, where the eyes are more to the side of the head and therefore have a non-overlapping field of view. Um, what does that give us? It gives us depth perception. Right? That of course means that we need a little bit more brain to process the information that deals with comparing the input between the two eyes so that the diff slight difference in the way the left eye views something versus the way the right eye views something is used to help compute information about the depth and distance to that object to get us that improvement in our sensing again, in this case, how far away an object is, which is important if I'm going to walk towards it, reach for it, whatever it is I might need to do. Right. Something else that happens is that um, while we know we have large brains, and one of the things that we see as brains have gotten bigger, the number of um, offspring that primates have is a lot fewer, right? Some simple animal species may end up with fewer uh, offspring. Okay, so this idea that um, we get uh, bigger brains and also uh, smaller um, um, numbers of offspring, uh, there is a direct relationship uh, for that. So as the uh, uh, evolution of bigger brains uh, has led to uh, this, this uh, smaller number of offspring, uh, one of the reasons for that is because there is a lot more energy that has to go into growing uh, these larger brains. This also means that infant development ends up being delayed. Human infants are among the most uh, underdeveloped of all of the um, animal species. So in that case, that means we have this term called neoteny. Neoteny means extended childhood. This is something that is particularly uh, true of, of primates, but especially for humans, that we have to be born with the brain nearly fully developed and ready to go. In many other animal species that do not have such a large cortex, um, their brains are, are functional, of course, when they are born, but there's uh, so much less development that has to happen in the cortex that they can grow other parts of their body uh, before they are born. So in many animals, for example, um, think of something like a deer or giraffe or, or something like that, or a horse perhaps, um, they're walking within minutes, if not hours, um, after they're born, right? In comparison, human infants take a full year before we can walk. So the trade-off there is that while the bodies of these other animal species uh, do more prenatal development, 
humans follow what's known as the cephalocaudal principle, which is that development goes in this head to tail. That's what cephalocaudal means head to tail direction where we grow our heads, that is the brain, before we grow any of the more peripheral uh, parts of the body. The reason for this is that we have to think back to that point about um, flexible behaviors, right? For an animal species that has more fixed behaviors, they don't need to have a lot of cortex. They don't need to have a lot of uh, uh, development that occurs in the cortex. But on the other hand, because humans rely so much on flexible behaviors, our cortex needs to be in place and ready to go from the moment we're born so that we are ready to start processing information. This is important because the connections in the brain, it's not just about having the neurons, the cells of the brain in place when we are born, but it's also about having the connections that are needed to communicate between the neurons. And it's these connections cannot be determined before we are born, right? That can be true in instinctual fixed behaviors, the kinds of connections and patterns of activation between neurons in the brain can all be determined uh, before we're born. That's the nature of an instinct, which is innate. But for flexible behaviors, that means the patterns have to form over time. And that means this that the brain has to be ready to start creating those patterns. So the neurons have to be there. The neurons have to be in place. The brain has to be nearly fully grown at the point we are born so that it's ready to start embedding those patterns. This is known as activity dependent development, right? The brain has, to, the, the, the development of the brain depends on uh, having an environment that fosters activity. It has to be a stimulating environment. So let's you know, have a look here at the uh, next slide. This is part of a lot of research that's been, that was done primarily in the middle of the 20th century uh, after these uh, discoveries had been made of just how much brain development in humans, uh, but even in some other animal species, as we can see here, depends so much on early sensory experiences. And this is uh, inspired what we would here call sensory deprivation studies so that we can see exactly what happens when an animal species lacks the appropriate stimulating environment. So on the left, we have a situation where rats were kept in a fairly standard environment, which here is described as a really basic little cage that just provides the essentials of food and water. But the enriched environment is one that you can see has uh, three uh, layers here with ramps and platforms and running wheels and lights and sound and, and motion activated stuff. So there's a lot of different uh, stimulating things. And even if you can see on one of the ramps that goes from the second to the third level, there's like a, a curtain hanging there so that this provides some more tactile experience as they go up and down that ramp. And what you see is that when you study the brains of these rats uh, after some period of time, after they've reached some juvenile age, um, the, the, the brains of these uh, rats living in the enriched environment are, are larger, have more connections, and these rats are capable of more complex learning uh, capabilities compared to the ones kept in that standard, uh, somewhat deprived environment. On the right, we see a situation where these kittens are kept in a fairly restricted environment that they can only see these vertical stripes painted on the walls. And their heads are yoked so that they can't turn to see the, because if you turn your head, the vertical stripe might be horizontal across the back of the eye, right? But in this case, uh, it is, is it's a purely vertical experience they have. And what we see is that the uh, development of the neurons in the visual parts of their brain uh, develops so that after some period of time goes by, these kittens can only see vertical stripes and their brain just simply is incapable of registering horizontal lines. And correspondingly, this affects their uh, behavioral abilities as well as the, the complexity of their brain. So we see that uh, early experience uh, is important, but especially when you look at higher animals, chordates and primates and humans, that have a larger cortex and therefore capable of more, le more flexible learning-based behaviors, we need some time in early childhood in order to, uh, to, to create these particular patterns in the brain. Now for kittens, of course, and rats, whose brains are a lot smaller and less flexible than, than humans, uh, this 
period of time. There is some neoteny here, but it extends only a few weeks or months in, in some cases here. Uh, again, for humans, as I noted, we're not walking for a year, but there's still other stuff that happens in the second and third and fourth years of life we, uh, that um, still show uh, reorganization occurring in our uh, brains as we develop over those first four or five years of our life. In fact, some evidence suggests that the human brain doesn't fully develop until we're nearly 25 years old. Uh, so you can see there's a really long extended development uh, for humans and the more enriching uh, and, and stimulating that in our environment is, uh, the better off we are. Okay, uh, next point here, when, when we start talking about um, this whole issue of, uh, let me hide this panel real quick here. Uh, when we start talking about comparisons uh, in the development of the, of the human brain is to think about human intelligence a little bit. And, and where is that coming from? Uh, you know, it seems to suggest here that as we start to develop bigger and bigger brains, again, this larger encephalization quotient, uh, which really focuses on the size of our cerebral cortex, we start to see that uh, our, our int intelligence increased. And here this graph shows that as the, the brain evolved across these various um, ancestors of, of uh, Homo sapiens, that that bigger brain led to a um, increase in intelligence and tool use in particular. Uh, you notice that the, on the, the graph on the right, the brain size is slightly larger for Neanderthals than Homo sapiens, but that's just raw brain size and not the encephalization quotient. Uh, so the Neanderthals had slightly larger body mass on average. So the encephalization quotient is still higher in Homo sapiens here. So, we seems to suggest that bigger brains means more intelligence, right? And so that's that's an important point to make, uh, except we need to think very carefully about what we conclude about this. Um, does that mean that when we look at humans and we wanna understand something about human intelligence, that we might be able to draw some comparison between individual humans and look at their brain sizes as if this might re re uh, relate somehow to intelligence. In fact, this connects a little bit to the phrenology examples that we were talking about before. I said that Franz Gall had come up with the idea that our, our various uh, intellectual skills could be compartmentalized in different regions of the cortex. But one of the reasons that I didn't really expand on that he was interested in measuring the bumps on the cranium was because he believed that uh, uh, cortical matter increased if you had an advanced ability in a specific domain, which would cause the, the brain to press out on that region of the, of the cranium. And so, uh, that of course means that individual differences in brain size and brain morphology could somehow predict ability, intellect, and, and things of this nature. But as it turns out, this doesn't really hold to be true. What is true is that when you wanna understand perhaps the intelligence of a species, you can make comparisons of brain size, right? So again, looking at that encephalization quotient can tell us something about the intelligence differences between species. But we have to be careful here about what we mean by the word intelligent. And I think we might be using at least two different meanings of the word. These across species comparisons that are focused on encephalization quotients, here intelligence seems to refer to things such as uh, uh, behavioral complexity or what we might call a behavioral repertoire, right? The ability to do more things, to have more flexible behaviors compared to fixed behaviors. Remember, humans very reliant on flexible behaviors and have very few fixed behaviors. Whereas a lot of other animal species are more focused on and more dependent on a few fixed behaviors and have a lot fewer flexibility or a lot less, I should say, flexibility in their behaviors and in their, in, in their brains. So increasing cort cortex size seems to drive the, the development of flexibility in behavior. And that as a as an across species comparisons makes a lot of sense. But sometimes when we use the word intelligence, we're also thinking about the concept of, of IQ, right? That is a person being more intelligent than another person because they have a higher IQ score, meaning that they might be a little bit better at solving certain kinds of problems. 
Although, of course, the nature of the kinds of questions and problems we ask people to solve when we administer an IQ test is still something of a, of a controversy that we haven't quite settled on exactly how to measure this thing that we call IQ. But none of these across species comparisons about behavioral complexity or flexibility has anything directly to say with regard to uh, within species comparisons of brain size, right? Because we cannot make this comparison to suggest that a person A with a bigger brain than person B means that person A is, has a higher IQ, is more intelligent than person B. That really doesn't hold to be true. Right? And there's lots of reasons for this, right? Well, there are some studies that find some small co correlation between um, pure brain size and humans compared to um, uh, their IQ. Uh, it, it doesn't really consistently hold. Um, and so, of course, not only does it lead to this you know, pseudoscience of phrenology, but it has led to a lot of other, as I say here, really bad ideas in, in the history of uh, psychology and mental testing research. So for example, this concept of social Darwinism, which is really a misnomer because it doesn't really relate to the same sort of thing that Darwin was exactly talking about. But um, we, the idea here that if we look at uh, human intelligence and try to ex say that, well, does human intelligence predict things like social success and, and career success and income and wealth and, and, and all this sort of thing? And um, if so, does that mean that people who have those higher levels of status um, are uh, more deserving of what they have because of it's just it's the unfolding of some natural evolutionary law. It says Darwin had said survival of the fittest, which actually originated before Darwin with a guy named Herbert Spencer. Um, and uh, then there was this further claim that's part of the social Darwinist uh, uh, agenda, which is that you can predict intelligence by physical characteristics. And of course, brain size is part of that. But of course, there's a variety of other um, racial implications related to this uh, supposed relationship between physical characteristics and IQ, right? And that has led to other problematic ideas such as eugenics, which in its softest form is merely just selective breeding, but of course, forced sterilization procedures and other things of that nature, uh, again, are really bad ideas. And by the way, this little note that I have here about the Darwin Awards, you may have heard of such a thing. We may sometimes encounter stories in the news about somebody who is doing some kind of uh, dumb and re reckless activity that, uh, and they and they die or maybe nearly die uh, in the process. And uh, we might say, oh, they've won a Darwin Award. And what do we mean by that? We, we're supposed, the suggestion, of course, is that they have weeded themselves out of the gene pool because they had a low IQ, and their low IQ Q is the reason that they did um, this this reckless thing. And uh, and and, and uh, so, of course, the claim is that um, humans are getting smarter uh, over generations because the, the, the lower IQ people are more likely to do these reckless things that weed themselves out of the gene pool and have fewer offspring and so forth. But that, of course, presupposes, as we were talking about when we talked about natural selection, that our natural environment is selecting higher IQ over low IQ. And that's not really the case, right? There's no... Uh, reason to suggest, even if, uh, you know, the larger brain of humans and the overall behavioral complexity is something that could have been selected for by nature, that our problem-solving abilities in Homo sapiens evolved to help us adapt to our environment, it doesn't mean that a higher IQ is being selected for by our natural environment compared to a medium or lower IQ, right? It just doesn't follow. Um, and of course, you know, further evidence like, you know, some of the smartest people in the world, like Einstein, they, they studied Einstein's brain, of course, and what they found is that um, it's totally uh, typical uh, in most respects, right? Uh, there's other findings, for example, so men, males on average tend to have larger brains than females, but of course males have larger bodies on average than females, um, and there's no difference. There's generally no average sex difference in, in IQ or intelligence, so um, it seems to get back to this question, like I said before, that defining intelligence at the species level in the terms of behavioral complexity and flexibility is not at all the same thing as is what we mean when we talk about intelligence at the level of IQ testing in humans. So we just need to be aware of that difference. And I think that pretty much wraps up our uh, initial chapter one content.